I am 30 seconds late in, um, in our timings to um, welcome uh, Stephen Bush, who is the political editor of The New Statesman, uh, a journalist, a political commentator and a podcaster who has also written for The Guardian, The Financial Times and The Eye newspaper and is chair of the Board of Deputies Commission on Racial Inclusivity in the Jewish Community. Um, I would like to thank him and he will be now in conversation with uh, Rabbi Mark Goldsmith and I understand there will be a little bit of time at the end of their conversation uh, for some questions um, and, I, and I hand over um, to them and um, thank you very much. Thank you Robert and thank you for bringing Stephen and I together. Um, having had the opportunity to, to read the report over, over the past weeks and also actually to incorporate it into sermons here at uh, Ezra Head and Reform Synagogue and to consider some of the issues. It really is a privilege, Stephen, to be able to speak with you about this report and how it might be put into action in all of our communities, our reform communities. And of course, many reform uh, community leaders are also part of other uh, aspects of Jewish community life. And this report, of course, is very wide ranging. Um, so we really want to hear from you, Stephen. And, um, we spoke a little bit before earlier this week and uh, the first question I'd really love to ask you is why was there in the first place, what got the idea for a commission of racial inclusivity in the Jewish community going? Why did this start? I know it started back in May, June 2020. Um, well, so um, the, the Board of Deputies will, will of course, um, from time to time make, make various statements about uh, issues of, of local, national and global concern. And um, and I think the, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, partly because we were all stuck at home and therefore seeing the uh, horrific footage was uh, such a moment of global concern. And when the board made a statement of solidarity, various um, organisations that had been um, campaigning um, for racial equality and inclusivity within our community and within British society essentially said, well, that's fantastic um, then you've done this but there are uh, issues a bit closer to home so if, you, if we could perhaps um, uh, turn to that so they then decided to set up this commission asked me to um, to chair it uh, and that's kind of it's so it, it in a sense it started last year but but of course as I hope is has been clear from the report and how I hope it's been more clear when I've talked about it so you know it builds on on the work of organizations like JCOR and Harif and Safadi Voices who, who without which and of course Lamud who, who without the various things they have done over the last couple of years I think there wouldn't have been as much um, momentum around the idea that we should uh, also look inward uh, and so that is the the origin story of, of, of the commission and its report. Thank you and one of the things that's so noticeable in the report and which makes it so very both very readable and also at times quite disturbing is the testimony from individuals within it, um, which says that uh, all the issues that step that became more we be, yeah, the world became more strongly aware of because of the murder of George Floyd meant that we had to look at ourselves and our own communities. Um, why did you accept um, the invitation to chair the commission? Well, when I was asked, I, I was I felt very honoured, but also um, uh, very uh, very nervous because because I'm mixed race. I worried I wasn't um, either Jewish enough or black enough to to do it properly. Um, and, and I I suppose if I'm honest, uh, when they called, I thought um, I kind of at first I thought, well, um, I'll go. Well, look, are you sure I'm the right person for this reason? Are you sure I'm the right person for this reason? And at the end of all of these, are you sure I'm the right person for this? They all say, actually, no, you're you're right. You're not the right person for this. We should get someone better, better to do it. When at the end they hadn't done it, um, I sort of hadn't anticipated I would ever get to choose. And so I kind of thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll trust in their wisdom. I'm very glad that I did. Um, uh, but yes, it, it was it was partly then I suppose because uh, I had uh, un well fortunately but also unfortunately I, I feel I, I'd got used to sort of working with people at the board over the the last five years that we've had because of uh, all of the various unhappinesses around the Labour Party mm -hmm. than I had grown to trust their judgment. I thought, okay, well even though I'm a bit nervous about my ability to do this well, I will trust in them and embark on this exercise. Thank you. 
Um, is the UK the first Jewish community to tackle the issue of racial inclusivity? Um, you, you speak about some of the organizations within our own community, you talk about Harif, Safadi Voices, j -Corps, which say that this has been long-term work, but um, is the UK the first to say, right, okay, it is really time we, we put our house in order as a community in terms of racial inclusivity within our community? Yes, as far as we know, outside the state of Israel, we are the only part of the diaspora to have done an exercise of this nature. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, I, I would emphasize, I say that as far as we know, and it is, of course, possible. In this, but, but as far as we know, yes, this, so we were, um, you know, building the, the plane as we flew it a bit, although I was very grateful for being able to look at um, various exercises done, commissioned by and within the state of Israel that provided some inspiration to some of the recommendations and parts of the framework that I used, as it were. Thank you. Um, in your introduction to the report, you made two very, very strong statements, which uh, <laughs> you always say, right, OK, learn this and probably the other 122 incredibly effective pages may not be so necessary if we can take these on. I just want to explore both of those. So let's start with the first one. You write, Jews have widely different views on what it means to be Jewish or to act Jewish, but there's no comprehensive means to look Jewish. You say racial diversity should never be a reason for exclusion. And much of the rest of the report is about horrendous examples of exclusion and how possibly to tackle it. So. What does exclusion mean when when you ref when you reference it in in that in that statement? Um, well, it can take sort of all sorts of forms. It, it can, you know, be as you know, as first as sort of as bold and as obvious as well. You don't look Jewish, um, and, um, and and of course, you know, as we have all had a horrendous reminder of over the past uh, few weeks and, and months, right? We we do face serious organized threats at our spaces. So there is of course a role for, um, for security and it is an important part of our ability to continue with our way of life. But uh, it does also have to be accompanied by um, welcome and sensitivity in terms of language um, uh, toward, towards when they, um, when, they, when they come to synagogue. I was at so when they come to shul, which brings me on to the other, uh, the other spot, which is, Sometimes it, it can be as simple as, um, it's, you know, language and is or isn't inclusive. So, I, as I say, I, I'm mixed race. I am, um, I'm, you know, I'm African and I'm also Ashkenazi. Um, and my story, and yeah, and my family story is, yeah, very much. You know, we came to the East End in the 19th century, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I heard very moving testimony from people from the Sephardi Mizrahi and Ethiopian diasporas resident in the United Kingdom, who basically say, well, you know, it's always a bit strange when someone says, this is called an X. And they said, well, it would be as simple as going, but we can also call it a Y. Um, and people feeling that their history has kind of been forgotten and, and, um, and sort of ignored. Now, of course, um, as with any diversity issue uh, that has wide applicability beyond our our scope um but yeah but i think essentially the 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 sort of central thing around in terms of there being no way to look jewish is just for people not to have the presumption that they aren't just because they don't look you know like my granddad essentially uh. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to come to that issue of Ashkenormativity, normativity, which is a wonderful, wonderful phrase, which uh, really we've taken on in our community and question ourselves about it. But first of all, one of the things that you speak about, and then I'll come to your, your, the, your second summary lesson, is outreach for representation. And <laughs> as we began our movement AGM um, 40 minutes ago, looking around all the screens, I thought, aha, this <laughs> we've got a point here, haven't we? How representative is are all the uh, 91 screens here of our community? What do we do to properly include all of the of the of the the, the, the diverse racial uh, content of our own community in representation such as at the reform movement AGM? It's a good question. So I'll, I'll sort of take you through sort of my journey through going through. So I have to be honest, I started the report 
sort of very strongly minded. And obviously in the end, I, I didn't um, to, to recommend anything like quotas or that kind of thing, because I don't think it's a particularly useful or appropriate tool um, for a community of our size. And I mean the whole of our, our, our community in the UK. I just think it's, it's too small for that to be particularly useful. Although I did hear very um, you know compelling testimony from various organisations which do use that, have found that helpful. And, and you yeah, know, there are obviously, uh, you know, 90 or different approaches, uh, even in this Zoom call. So I'm not saying that if that doesn't work for organisations, they shouldn't do it. But I, I instead thought and the really helpful thing was things like, you know, the, board, the stuff the Board of Deputies has done to increase the number of young people standing, encouraging within the specific uh, context of, of representation of the Board of Deputies, encouraging synagogues to use their allocation in full, because when they do, you what's tended to happen is, um, oh, the second person is a woman and the second person's and the third person's young and then the fourth yeah and you actually get more representation rather than just going okay whose turn is it to go let's just send our our, our one person so I think um proactively asking people um to stand or to do things is is probably the the best approach I think also though um in general I'm a big believer than um representative leadership isn't just about whether or not the faces at the top look representative because I think there's a hard limit to what you can do with that in any organization um it's partly about leaders having the confidence to um to lead in a way that shows they recognize the diversity of their community and I'll use a specific example from a piece of testimony which didn't quite make it into the final report as quoted although it is if you read it I think if you've read it it'll be fairly obvious which, which bit I'm referring to um which is a very powerful bit of testimony where someone's saying what they didn't like, don't like, is whenever when they, when they in their phrase when they when they go home to the state of Israel, they feel um, they obviously didn't use the phrase home to the state of Israel. I used that really cumbersome bit of language there. Um, when they go home, they said, "I'm in a multiracial democracy. I see lots of people who look like me." And they said, "And then I go to synagogue here, and I see a bunch of pictures um, of Israel that just look like um, well, they said that just look like Hornsey and Wood Green." Actually, obviously, the shows don't even look like Hornsey and Wood Green. Um, and that's not a solution that requires that person to be in a leadership position. That's just about leadership organisations representing and thinking about how they embody um, our community in all of its hues and, and representation. Thank you. Um, your second sort of summary lesson in your intro, really, I think, plucks at the heartstrings of reform Judaism and actually our two new communities in Shenfield and the Isle of Wight, I suspect it's part of their work, which is we all say our communities have a proactive attitude to inclusion. And as you say, that draws in many people of all backgrounds who felt marginalized, left out or turned off from Jewish life. That's part of the raison d'etre for reform synagogues. But you also say that actually inclusivity that works properly for black Jews, Jews of color, Sephardi, Mizrahi and Yemenite Jews is part of how to have a feeling of inclusivity. Again, this sense of you come to synagogue, you come to a community and you meet people who are prominent within that community of all, of, of, of all, part, of all backgrounds. You then say, give people a sense of belonging and full ability to participate. Can you talk a little bit about some of the barriers to that full ability to participate and that sense of sense of belonging. Yeah. So, yeah. As I as I say in the report, um, ultimately, in any exercise of the type of this report, you are, yeah. I occasionally refer to the issues of racial inclusivity as an iceberg issue, right? In the, we had lots of testimony about people saying things like, you know, I arrived and no one spoke to me, or I, yeah, this thing happened and it wasn't clear who I should complain to, and there wasn't, uh, you know, clear guidance on the website or, or whatever. Well, obviously, if someone arrives and there's no one there whose job it is to greet new people once they've got past the security, mm -hmm. that's not just an issue for people within our scope. Um, and if someone something happens and someone isn't sure how to complain to, that's not just an issue for people with within our within our scope. I think the kind of the two central um sort of ways i think that we can we can be more welcoming more inclusive uh, firstly and and I, and I would strongly emphasize while urging people to read it that um yeah it's not a tablet of stone um 
many of the recommendations, of course, um, will require finessing in the implementation, not least because there are, you know, a variety of challenges about, you know, who owns their building, who has a building, who rents a building, you know, all, you know, all of that stuff, right? My my own, you know, I say my own as if I as if I uh, ever actually go, as opposed to, as opposed to just feeling guilty about not going. But the synagogue, which I have a very involved relationship with, not going to works out of a school, right? So you know, there, there are different there are different challenges about. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 some parts of our report, you know, are, are perhaps less relevant to, but I think the central things are one, having um, someone in a leadership position, in a lay position, who has responsibility for welcome, because there is inevitably um, an irreconcilable tension between effective security and effective welcome. Mm. But once someone has come through security, there should be someone else whose role it is to ensure welcome as well. There are, I think, small things that I recommend in the report and can make security itself um, more welcoming. You know, a simple greeting of Shabbat Shalom at the end of the process, for example. But the um, the analogy I stole from one of our, our witnesses, although didn't, this analogy didn't make it into the final report, is, you know, they said, you know, when, when you come in through Ben Gurion, right, you have a very difficult time, but then at the end, loads of people want to sell you something and you kind of feel sort of you're welcomed either into Israel or into the world of duty free. Uh, and they said, what I would like my synagogue to have there to be a similar kind of I've gone through that and now, I, now I'm welcomed. And then the second thing is, is a more proactive process around complaints. Now, I certainly experience in my own organization that when we have a complaint at the New Statesman, you kind of go around, you know, kind of beating our breasts, going, oh, this is really awful. What do we do about this? We aren't there. We aren't always necessarily very good at fixing the process as opposed to just litigating the original circumstance. And it's why sort of I think in some ways the most important recommendation is I'm urging organizations to have, you know, not angry, but regular listening exercises across a whole swathe of issues um, just so that they have an opportunity to go, OK, here's some things we could have done better. Here's some things we did well that we'd like to do more of. Um, but where they can sort of take all of that in together, because throughout the process, I heard huge amounts of testimony from people who you know, actually visibly weren't in our scope, or people who visibly were who thought they weren't. But what they all had in common was is that this was the first open ended listening exercise uh, that the board had done uh, for some time. And it just meant that, and I just think that demonstrates one of the ways that we can be welcoming is to have um, regular listening exercises. That's partly because then we as leaders can be um, in a mood where we're receptive to hear it. With my own political correspondence, I'm much better at taking feedback when I do our 360, hey guys, how do you feel I'm doing as your manager, than I am when, you know, on a Thursday of a late vote, they say, I really wish you hadn't done that. And so so I think those those for me are the kind of central ways that we can, we can be more welcoming. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, a couple of comments are coming through in our chat from David Sapir, uh, talking about how Jewish or communal organizations in Argentina and Chile have commissioned similar initiatives, which is very interesting to hear. And from Daniel McIntosh, talking about from safe spaces, supporting the growth of leaders of color in our congregations and creating those safe spaces. So from those two, thank you very much, Daniel and David. I want to get to some tough lists for um, organizations. Um, at, within Reform Judaism, synagogues, etc. Um, <clears throat> you've talked about welcoming and our sister movement in America, uh, the Union for Reform Judaism, has a word for this. They talk about audacious hospitality, which means actually just going out there and in some ways, I suppose, doing something that can be a difficult thing for many of us, which is audaciously welcoming people into the building. And you talk about continuity of personnel, the sense that there is a group within the synagogue that takes this as a serious responsibility, um, hopefully a beautiful responsibility. Um, could you speak about that continuity of people being involved in ensuring there is a proper welcome for the whole diversity of our community? Right, yes, so I think audacious welcome, al although I have to admit, I felt myself getting very British at the thought of being <laughs> audaciously welcomed by a, a bunch of Americans, but um, but I, th I think it's a useful, a useful concept. Um, so in terms of continuity of personnel, it, it's twofold. Firstly, it's just, um, you know, um, in spaces where um, there is no volunteer component to security, uh, and it, it's, you know, it, it's all outsourced and, and brought in, um, People would often talk about having this issue that they would um, they would go every week. They would be got to know by um, by the security personnel, and then the security would change, and they would go right back to the beginning um, 
of having to do the no i come here every week and now obviously from a security perspective that's really not great that that, that yeah that shouldn't happen anyway but um but continuity of personality I think is partly about um there's nothing you know i think there's nothing more unwelcoming than once you've been welcome and felt welcome for you know six months a year two years three years your childhood uh to then suddenly feel unwelcome because the person whose um responsibility is it, it is changes and there is no institutional memory now obviously that's a huge challenge for uh, organizations that are dependent on volunteers but um but it and again it i guess it's does come back to my point then all of this does have broader applicability which is then um if we're better at ensuring than um you know volunteers and lay leaders have uh some sense of what's gone before them and that they have handover periods rather than the kind of you know this is your responsibility now good luck mm -hmm. um then that automatically creates more welcoming spaces in addition to the the sort of important and again up uh, you know, for those of you who have very small uh, theater committees, I can understand why you go, well, that wouldn't work for us. But having someone who has a specific role, um, you know, inside to, to do welcome and therefore to kind of keep track of that kind of thing, um, because it does mean that instead of having this sort of ad hoc thing where, you know, to use a sort of specific example of one of the benefits of continuity as someone who's very bad at only turning up um, for key dates and, and, and vessels, I expect to be questioned and asked why I'm I'm there. Um, if uh, you know some of our witnesses who are you know very observant, very devout, who turn up every week, uh, understandably don't like and kind of resent being lumped in with you know people like me who only turn up for the high holy days, if at all. Uh, and um, and so yeah, and that's the other kind of thing that continuity of personnel allows you to get better at is knowing who is a regular and who is not, who needs to be welcomed and who doesn't, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and so on. Thank you. And um, going on, uh, one of the one of the issues you bring up that I know for some of us has absolutely been an issue. We recognise that it has been an issue for us at Edgware Hendon Reform Synagogue um, in a way that we felt really bad about when we had a conversation with a number of black families within our community, all of whom told us that that had to an extent been their experience. Um, as uh, as the uh, the partner of one of our black members said, I expect my husband to be the one who gets stopped as we come in on the high holy days. And we thought that was just such a horrendous thing to hear. So racial profiling for security sounds to it is clearly something that is very, very damaging to the welcome that we should have. You speak uh, then about how a complaints process for venues and security teams have to be very transparent and clear. Um, so that a so that we hear whenever this is not be being handled badly, um, this feels very very important. Um, so, do you feel have you got a good example of a complaints process to make sure that if racial profiling is being used, you also spoke about the Somali carer of a regular uh, attender of a of a synagogue, where this is happening, how to make sure that that's challenged and fixed quick before the damage is being done. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as the security challenge uh, is concerned, um, the complaints process as, as proposed in the report is the thing that is the most new because the the difficulties we have excellence in security in terms of the guidance of the CST. Um, I've been very much led uh, by them by what they describe as as yeah, excellent security and they have been very clear both in advocacy, you know, they've yeah, they've argued this in the EU, they've argued this government, then they don't think racial, pro they think racial profiling as well as being illegal is, you know, is simply not, not helpful and appropriate. Um, but one of the problems uh, that was unearthed in the process of the report is in addition to um, these things making people feel unwelcome and excluded, um, they were light years away from best practice as far as security is concerned. And the, the only people who can adjudicate what is best practice and what is good behavior are ultimately the CST. So what I'm recommending happens is that in addition to having a transparent and an open complaints process uh, at synagogue or any, at any other space of which there are lots of uh, examples where it is just as simple as it being on the homepage and it being easy to access and people then when they make a complaint being given an immediate sense of well here's what's going to happen to your complaint. Then security complaints do also need to be referred up uh, to the CST 
uh, because they are are the the experts. Um, as as the board produces its implementation proposals, there there will I imagine be lots more about the detail of that. But the the central point there is about making sure that, that expertise in security is is being used um, is being used and spread uh, throughout throughout our community. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let's move on to ASCA normativity, um, which I, I, I totally recognise that as a rabbi. I'm just about to hit my 25th year in the rabbinate and guilty, uh, guilty as charged, undoubtedly. Uh, in the report, there's again moving testimony about um, progressive synagogues, reform synagogues being an, a very, very welcome home for inclusivity in various different ways. However, the song, as it like, as is written in the report, the songs of any typical Shabbat service are full of lila lila lilies, as if every Jew comes from the shtetl. The newsletters, sermons refer reference Yiddish words, guilty. Their kiddishes are full of Eastern European flavors, uh, gefilte fish balls and no kibes. Um, and most important, the Sidur musical traditions of the services, minhagim, are generally Ashkenazi within our synagogues who are proud to say we are inclusive. Our Safadi father in your report says, it's really hard to pass my heritage down to my children through a reformed synagogue. Um, when I joined a progressive synagogue, he said for the High Holy Days, I asked someone if we could include some Mizrahi and Safadi tunes in the service. And they responded with, no, I want to hear the tunes I heard growing up. Well, said this father, so do I. <laughs> So Ashka normativity and what we might do as reform synagogues programmatically to get this better. Yeah, th this was not least because it's a word that I still struggle to pronounce without a run up. This, this was a, a, a big sort of journey for me. And then um, I'm Ashka normative, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do. I mean, I've got better at it through the process of this report. I do just tend to assume that my family story is the story of, of you know, if, I meet another British Jew. I kind of assume that that, that, that is that is our shared um, story, and it, it's right and it's good that I should be proud of my uh, family story. And I, I, I'm not saying that we should, um, you know, we should we should recoil from from every uh, Yiddishism, but I, I do think it is as simple as kind of central guidance to go. Well, we call this an X, but we also call it a Y because yeah, that that father you, you, you quoted, yeah, also talked. I'm not quite sure if I was able to get it into the final report. But he talked about, you know, the strangest of, you know, doing a, a tour in which um, the Sephardi founders of the reform movement were kind of sort of forgotten and it was all just a very narrative. So it's as kind of simple as going, OK, well, where in our history have we sort of forgotten and where can we where can we re-include um, the, the Sephardi story and contribution? And um yeah, and then just kind of, yeah, well, yeah, we call this an X, but it's also called a Y, or in some cases, we call this an X and we call it a Y. Um, so I think it's partly about, um, yeah, providing textual guidance about, you know, yeah, language, what things are called. Um, and now, and there are, I would emphasize, there are lots and lots of reform spaces which do this uh, very well. Um, but that, that to me is kind of the central thing, it's just providing, um, you know, kind of better guidance. And I hope that, the 30th of November, which is the day to mark the um, uh, the expulsion of, of Jews from, from the Arab countries in the Middle East, will also be a, a moment where best practice and good resources can be shared, and that can be um, a spur for um, synagogues and other spaces to um, to to yeah to, to be more exclusive of, of Sephardi and, and Israeli Jews. Thank you, and we're proud at EHRS that your report inspired us to commemorate Farhood Day uh, this year with uh, a. We've come so far, day we called it, which was about three different Sephardi communities and actually bringing that teaching out to all of our all of our community. But I know we've got a heck of a long way to go. We love our youth movements and they're extremely important. However, again, there's disturbing testimony in the report of a young person saying, "I've been subject to racism and comments on camp, or just feeling out of place within youth summer camps." Um, Racism on our summer camps and that feeling, again, presumably our, what we need in our youth movements is exactly what we need of our synagogues, and actually this is where it all starts. Are there examples of good programming that you heard about which help to uh, address the issues of racial inclusivity? Um, yes, there, were, there, was, there, was lot, there were lots and lots of really bits of great practice in, in youth uh, groups. One of the things I, I didn't want to do, partly because the, you know, no one else got to well people got to see bits of the report in the maximization process but i didn't want to sort of um kind of 
force people I thought were good practice to go right and and you know you are now going to be sort of judged and, and lumped into whatever backlash the report may get but almost all of the recommendations in the report are bits of best practice that exist within our community here and the ones that aren't are bits of best practice that exist um uh in israel so um yeah in terms of youth groups there was lots of really great stuff i think one of the underlying issues was in general particularly in youth groups but i think across the was kind of almost a sort of um you know oh well we understand that because we all, we all experience racism as Jews. So we don't really need to have a specific policy for how to, to, to tackle that in youth spaces. That does not something we need to equip volunteer youth leaders to be able to deal with because they know all about that. Um, we all have firsthand university of life experience in tackling this stuff, um, which is true, but I think it's not, well, there's, there's a reason why the, the first, you know, the first rule, uh, you know, after we left Egypt was, you know, how to look up stage, something we had first-hand experience of, because the experience of oppression does not make you an expert uh, in, in, in dealing with it. And then there was a specific underlying, uh, underlying issue that lots of places which had um, good processes for people who were, you know, Jewish and something like myself, didn't really have a framework for dealing with very obviously racial, uh, raci racist incidences when they were about people who were just different types of, you know, so someone who's wholly Ethiopian Jewish, wholly Sephardi, Sephardi Jewish, wholly uh, Mizrahi Jewish, experiencing very obvious racism. Um, there was a kind of issue and it sort of fell, fell, fell within the cracks and then there's you know, huge amounts of national policy about what you should do on racism, uh, between communities but not very much about what you should do within thank you um jewish day schools are part of uh, jewish life in a number of our communities but um where there is a jewish day school locally how are they doing on uh and can we be part of helping there to be a a better policy within them around black history and consciousness of black contribution to to, to our national life and our international life. Um, I guess I'm working on the assumption, and I can see it in the report as well, that because of the kind of monoglot nature of Jewish day schools, these things can be much less dealt with as in diverse schools out in the mainstream sector. What do you feel we should be doing uh, to, to counter that? Well, um, yeah, we had a lot of testimony, both good and bad about schools. Um, uh, as as you sort of say correctly, there is a huge amount of, un of hunger among parents of, of all stripes um, who want their children to be um, raised and educated in their Jewish identity, but they also want them to be able to have the same diversity of experience they perhaps had if they went to a school that wasn't uh, a communal school. Um, and again, that's that's across across our community, including people who themselves were outside of our scope. Um, obviously schools have a huge amount of um demand from on high at the moment and that will become you know more difficult uh i was about to say as we leave the pandemic which may be my optimism talking as we hopefully begin to meet a situation where we don't have continual self-isolation and and stop start uh, of of children's education but the big area of flexibility is in part about um using the optional modules to teach about british history and all its um diversity but also there was a general belief among school leaders that the area where there was the most flexibility in terms of the curriculum was Jewish studies. Uh, and that was the ideal place to teach people about the diversity of our community and its diaspora. Uh, so that is very much somewhere where, um, where you can play a, an active role. Uh, Page is doing brilliant work, the board's doing brilliant work, and, and they will both again be producing proper Im implementation plans over the next uh, coming uh, week, days, weeks and months. Thank you. Now. We've now reached the last 10 minutes of this conversation. And what's wonderful is a conversation has been going on in the chat, as you may see. Um, a couple of things I'd like to pick up from that, and then perhaps we can then broaden things out a little bit. Um, there's, for example, Daniel McIntosh speaking from McCaw Haim speaks about a course which is available uh, from jewishjustice.co.uk, an anti-racism course for British synagogues to get involved in and to sign, sign members up for. So that's an interesting one. Andrea Zanardo speaks about the long line of reform Sephardi rabbis from Sammy, Simon Francis and Sammy Pereira, Zichwanam Livracha, 
whose voices are rarely heard. And he may also be speaking about uh, Italian Jewish rabbis as well. Um, but we'll come back to that. There was a, a direct question from Jonathan Lewis. How do we incorporate Sephardi and Mizrahi practice naturally without it becoming a museum piece introduced by those who didn't grow up with it? It's a that is a really good question. I think um, in part it's, it is about using the wisdom within our communities um, that is, you know, that, yeah, that does exist, um, that is, you know, live, I was slightly hesitating from using the term living and breathing, uh, but I, I think, um, I think one of the ways it works is yeah, you sort of don't want it to be this kind of like in the past we were X, but now we're Y, because that's kind of superficially more inclusive, but it's not better. That said, I, I, I would really, really like to associate myself with um, Rabbi Andrea's suggestion about uh, a service of, of memory, because I, it, something that did come up time and time again was how difficult it is to have a situation where you, you know, your great grandparents are buried in another country. The uh, cemetery may well have been desecrated or built over or had all sorts of awful things happen at it. And there is no, there is nowhere you can go or there's nowhere that it is marked in your community. So that is, yes, something that is from the past, but that is a, a living, yeah, that, that, it, that is a, a living, a living thing. Uh, and I think it is in part about finding things that are living things. So, you know, the memorial of things that have been lost and people still feel keenly, um, giving opportunities for organisations like Harif and Safadi Voices to to come into spaces, uh, giving you know, um, you know, yeah, active courses, work through RS, RSY. I think so. It, it is making sure that this stuff, which is is living and breathing, even if the subject matter is 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 memory, that is a living and breathing act, rather than. Although I think it is important also for us to recognise the contribution of, of Safadi Jews to founding the Board of Deputies, setting up the reform movement. But it, it's also partly about finding things that are resonant to today. Thank you. What I'd now like to do is to go directly to, to a couple of people who've raised a hand and please feel welcome to do so. Let's go to Sharon, Sharon Cousins. Sharon, if you would unmute yourself and please ask your question or contribute your, your idea to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a most fascinating discussion. And I would say that things are definitely improving from the sort of rather nasty discrimination my mother felt when she came to this country from Calcutta uh, to the some of the discrimination my brother had to the fact that my kids think the coolest part about their Judaism is that heritage. So they that's a wonderful thing. I would say um, in my own community, which is very welcoming and very inclusive, I don't think it's an issue of racism. I think it's an issue of ignorance. And I think a lot of the Ashkenaz community are just not very well aware of the voices of the Sephardi and the Mizrahi community to the extent that I'm not sure that a lot of Ashkenaz Jews understand that I am not Sephardi. They describe me as Sephardi. I'm not Sephardi, I'm not from Spain, I'm not from Portugal. My family's from India and Baghdad. So even within that, to use Sephardi as a catch-all term, when within that there's an awful lot of other things, and I am Mizrahi, I, I think it's just a, a lot of education, and I don't really, I hope it's not racism. That's just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in the chat, one of the things I'm seeing is lots of resources being referenced. Everything, yeah, you mentioned Sephardi voices, you mentioned Harif, uh, authors such as Lynn Julius, the course that Daniel McIntosh and Makor Chaim spoke about, uh, the memorial services that Rabbi Andrea in Brighton spoken about, the practice, the good practice from CST that we just heard about in our chat from Cardiff Reform and also from the Northern Network. And so there's a lot around. I, I've, we, I've, I hope we can preserve this chat because you can see the beginning of a resources bank for our Reform Judaism, and I know that's what Savita and Amit are very much into, making sure we have resources for ourselves. Where do you feel that, um, Stephen, where that we could go to for good resources to get to be better as communities in this, in this, this area so that we could genuinely say Reform communities are working towards racial inclusivity? Um, well, I think it's a really good question because I, I, I think Sharon is, is exactly right. And actually, even 
with a handful of exceptions, even the, the most awful um, bits of testimony in our report are primarily the result of ignorance rather than deliberate um, malice. Um, I mean, I think in part, this is a bit of a, well, you yourselves are, are a, a resource of, of wisdom as, as the conversation in the chat itself is showing, right? Then, then um, I hope that as the board moves to its implementation plan, one of the things it will do is it will be the sort of landing zone um, for, for a lot of, of, of good practice. But, uh, you know, I'm not just doing this in a kind of, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers that old episode of The Simpsons where they go, I thought they could rock in Shelbyville, but no, not as hard as they do in Springfield. I'm not just saying that because I'm speaking to the reform movement, but a lot of the best practice I recommend in this report emanates from the reform movement. So I think it is partly about you yourselves being a, a hub of best practice, of sharing, oh, well, we did this thing and it worked well. Or also, actually, this is something I realised that we all should be better at doing is, someone going, we did this, it, it was a disaster, here's what I would do again differently, and being able to say we did this, it was a disaster, and here's why it was a disaster, without everyone kind of going, oh, they tried this and it was a disaster. Um, but but I, I think actually, yeah, a, a, as the conversation in the chat shows, you, you yourselves are, are, are a hub of, of, of knowledge and of, of, of best practice. Um, and so, so part of the process of implementation will be the reform movement itself being a home for 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 this stuff. Thank you. Uh, one issue that you pick up in the report, uh, this will probably be our final question to make sure we can get to the resolution, is hurtful Jewish texts, which reference uh, black people um, and actually other people of any sort in a very disparaging way within our Bible, within our Tanakh. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the prophet Balaam was saying lovely things about how good are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, while being extremely mean to anybody else um, that the Israelites might possibly come across. So we know it's sitting there. What do we do with those texts as we study them? Uh, what, what, what do you feel we should do? Do we not read them? Do we interpret them? What, 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 what ideas have you come across, Stephen, that, that might help us to deal with these texts which are there in our own sources? Um. Well, um, I will choose my words very carefully, and I, I've, um, I would uh, urge any, everyone to, to read this section in particular, where I have, have, have been able to be much more careful than, 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 than one could be speaking off the cuff. But um, it's obviously, well, I think it obviously would not be appropriate for us not to talk about those texts and just to kind of pretend they, they don't exist. I was to say to put them in a black box, which is perhaps a slightly poor choice of analogy, but... Um, I think, um, you know, we always know that, that it's partly about thinking about the text, arguing about the text, trying to learn from the text, discussing discussing the, from the, the text. I think and hope that the recommendations in the report are a good starting point. I think in an odd way, actually, the thing I would urge everyone and everyone here, particularly anyone in preaching, not to do is not just to sort of look at something problematic and go, oh, I should just skate over that. Um, then I think actually, because for anyone who hears any of those bits of, you know, I, I always think of myself as, you know, the kind of over life, you, you know, we all develop a special ear for anti-Semitism and you develop a special ear for, for any form of racism because you get used to hearing it in your day-to-day -day life. And it can be tempting um, when you get it, getting something in a text, which is a bit to go, okay, well, I just won't talk about it. Um, but actually, I think then the, the best thing to do um, for a bit of leadership is, is always to go, look, look, here's what the text says here. Yeah. You know, and then to talk about what the text mean or means or might not mean in an open, um, in an open way, rather than the kind of like, here's what the text says. Oh, let's just draw a discrete veil over that and, and move on. Uh, oh, that would be, be my approach, but I very much defer to the much, much wiser people who have been very helpful to me throughout the process of, of the, of writing the report and of, of its aftermath. Thank you. And, and that question was from Leslie Bergman, who also refers us to the communities in South Africa, um, and I assume particularly reform communities that have been dealing with this absolutely directly as part of what we should do um, in order to be able to understand the whole extent of our community. So thank you, Leslie, for that. So, yes, uh, my, Rabbi Michael Hilton, you'll see in the chat, brings up one particular text and the choice in translation 
which makes a heck of a difference um, if you put an and or a but. And of course, we often translate straight out of uh, Torah or out of Tanakh. And we have choices to make. Stephen, we need to come to an end because it's very important that we as a movement now move forwards. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your candor, for also all the work that went into this report. Uh, there's a beautiful testimony at the beginning of it from Marie van der Zyl, the president of the Board of Deputies, about the power of the report and how much it's meant to her that it's, it is there. And now, of course, the Board of Deputies are going to put it into action. Our question is, is the movement for reform Judaism going to do so? We really thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. And if you would like to hear more from Stephen Bush, all you need to do is read The Spectator or listen to the uh, Spectator, uh, sorry, Spectator, New Statesman. Got that completely wrong. My apologies. My, my mother does that all the time as well. Oh, shit. OK, thank you very much. The, the New Statesman or the New Statesman podcast in which you will find uh, Stephen speaking very regularly. Thank you. So let me now hand back to Robert, um, uh, the chair of our meeting, as chair of our movement. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Mark, and thank you, Stephen. Um, can I just reassure everybody um, that uh, we have managed to capture everything in the chat, um, and we will, and, and, and Sarita's probably going to panic now, but I'm sure we'll put everything together and, and uh, distribute um, the, the relevant resources out to um, everybody that was here today and also over the, to, commu over, over, um, to the communities um, as well. We are now going to, um, I'm now going to read out the resolution that we are proposing and um, and then we will then we will vote on it officially. So <clears throat> the racial inclusivity resolution is as follows. The movement for reform Judaism seeks to be an anti-racist movement. One of our core values is creating inclusive egalitarian communities which value difference. We cherish the racial and ethnic diversity within our movement. We abhor all racism and prejudice. We will not tolerate it within our movement and we will ensure that there are appropriate consequences when it arises. We are committed to nonviolent challenges to all injustice and will use our voice on the national and international stage to stand against racism. Following the Board of Deputies report on racial equality in the Jewish community, the movement for reform Judaism and its affiliated communities are committed to adopt an appropriate policy in the spirit of the report's recommendation at our next AGM. So can we now, um, on the basis of that, please issue the, um, the, uh, the, the voting system so that we can vote on that. Uh, thank you. Um, that would indicate that we have 96 percent um, of, of an approval so we can consider that to be carried um, just for the sake of the record there were um, four abstentions <clears throat>